Greetings, my name is Pete Ring. My background is in military aviation and in particular fighters and choppers. I do these chats on behalf of Air Force Association New South Wales and on behalf of Wings Magazine and Wings Australia YouTube channel. Could I also ask that if you like our videos then please subscribe to our channel and have a look at the description on our channel for this video and you'll find links to subscribing to our magazine called Wings and subscribing to Air Force Association New South Wales. I'd like to welcome Barry Schultz to this discussion. Um, so Barry, thanks for coming and thanks for participating. G'day Ringo, good to see you again. Been good. a while. <laughs> That's me. Um, I, uh, what, you're in Vietnam and I wanted to have a chat with you about being a forward air controller. Now forward air controllers are commonly known as FACs. So we may say that word several times in the next 30 or so minutes, but uh, just so people uh, do understand a fact is a forward air controller. So what years were you in, what year were you in Vietnam about? I uh, went to Vietnam uh, nine months in 1970 out of, oh, I, I was up at Butterworth at the time. Yeah. And um, went up there uh, into Mong Tau, did some basic training on the O2 conversion. And then went back to Vong Tau, and that's where I spent my nine months. Okay, Vong Tau. Okay, so what? What? Um, what's the general duties like? What's the general job of a forward air controller, just generally speaking? Generally, it's he's he's the coordinator, the manager, if you like, um, of air support for ground troops. He's got to know what's happening on the ground, and he's got to know what's happening in the air, and he puts it all together in a safe manner. Good. And um, which, which aircraft were you flying? I flew the O2. Um, I was a bit disappointed not to fly the OV-10, but uh, <laughs> after all, it's a platform, it's got radios and it's got rockets and wings. You don't need anything else. <laughs> I was thinking too, I was, I was going to say, well, which do you think was? what? How many types of facking aircraft were available and which, which do you think? It sounds like the O2 was the one. Yeah, uh, they started off, with, started off with the OV-1, yeah. sorry, the O-1. Oh, um, wow. It was a bit limited. Um, it was very small um, uh, and um, very slow. Uh, it, its advantage is it could land in little dirt strips. Yeah. And the disadvantage was that you therefore had to live with the troops. So you, <laughs> you, got, you got dirty. Yeah. <laughs> um, the O2 was a replacement for the O1, and it, it had a lot of advantages in that it um, had two seats, two engines, carried more, could go faster, uh, and uh, it, it could land at reasonably sized 1,500-foot strips, but it, it, it tended to like hard surfaces rather than dirt, dirt and dust. Yep. And then there was the Bronco, was there? Yeah, the AV-10, they, they were sort of on the production board about the same time in 1966. Um, uh, yeah. Um, they, the USF recognised the need for something to replace the O-1, um, uh, got the O-2, and then that was an interim aircraft, I guess, between the AV-10 coming along. Okay. Um, there was more AV-2s uh, produced than AV-10s. Okay. So the general question, the airspace around um, the Vietnam where you were generally flying? Was it a, a um, very busy or what was the airspace like in regard to other traffic? Uh, it was very busy. Um, it was controlled fairly tightly um, uh, at, at the sort of at the strategic level, I guess. You know, at high levels you had all the fighters going all under radar control. But once you got into the lower below 5,000 foot into the area you're operating in, uh, one of the biggest fears was a mid-air collision. Right. And it was, it was with basically helicopters. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm suggesting US Army helicopters because they were driven by guys straight out of school. You know, they were just gung-ho, um, a totally different kettle of fish were our helicopter pilots and our operations. They they were predictable and and everybody coordinated their activities. 
in regard to your job and what were the general types of aircraft you were uh, operating within the attack aircraft? Predominantly uh, F-100s. Um, they were operating at a ben Benoit, so, uh, sorry, um, yeah, Benoit. They, they were only 30, 40 minutes away. Um, uh, we got a lot of um, Canberra's um, out of Cam Cameron Bay, two squadron. Um, then there was a mixed bag of uh, A37s from the VNAF, um, A1s from the VNAF. Uh, and so there was a mixed bag. And because uh, the weather up north was quite bad, um, it was clear down south. So if they couldn't work up up north, they came to us. And sometimes we we're just so busy, we we're sort of almost sending them away. So while well, we're talking about that, but who was tasking you and who were you? Who, who was mostly your client? Uh, we, uh, Bungtau, the province, um, the Jade Fax, for which I worked and was Jade 7, following on from people like Dave Robson, Pete Larrard, and so on. Um, we totally supported um, uh, exclusively one ATF, the Australian okay. Task Force in, in Vietnam. Okay. How do they um, request you for task? Not you particularly, but how do they request an aircraft for tasking? Was that pretty efficient, and pretty quick? Yeah, it was. It's a really well organised uh, organisation. Um, I think at Benoit they had the uh, tactical air combat system, uh, and they they all the tasks from all the people throughout the provinces of the South Vietnam went to that organisation. They got approvals and sent it down to the uh, Direct Air Support uh, Centre. They massaged it further again, and then it came down to the Tactical Air Combat Party, and that was at Nui Dat, where the Army was. And then that was the information was then uh, out to the facts themselves in just like a flying program. Uh, you were tasked to meet various pre plan basically, or visual reconnaissance missions. Okay. Um, did you carry any other stores besides rockets? Uh, yeah, a nine mil pistol, <laughs> a, big, a big knife about this long, <laughs> and um, hand smoke grenades. Uh, they were sort of a backup when he ran out of uh, had fourteen rockets. What was uh, that over the side? Was it? Yeah, he just chucked them out the window uh, carefully, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, we had a. Um, AR-15, I think it was, rifle. That was for the shoot yourself before they got you. <laughs> Keep the monkeys away. I'm not sure which. <laughs> yes, I've experienced that before when you're carrying a pistol and you go, why the hell am I carrying this? But yeah, nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did, 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 to aim your rockets, did you have a gun sight or did you come up with some other much simpler um, <laughs> Yeah, the aircraft, the aircraft was fitted with a gun sight. It was just a fixed sight. Um, no, no um, adjustment, and uh, it wasn't really necessary. Like when I was instructing as an instructor pilot, uh, I used to just put a bit of China Graph on the front windscreen. What's a China Graph? China Graph is a grease pencil, right? And it right. made a black mark put across there. Uh, you got a gun sight. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. That was a gun like going back to when you had your scarf in the breeze. Uh, exactly. Yep. Did you did you operate both day and night? Yeah, mostly days. Um, I got a lot of guys, uh, inexperienced guys, straight up, straight off of uh, fact school. They needed to, you know to do it day and night, bad weather and all that sort of stuff. So um, we did a lot of training at night. Uh, I put in about three or four night fact missions using uh, target logs dropped by another another or another O two. Um, then we had fighters come in, and, and I think once we saw um, um, the Goonie Bird, the, the, the gunship um, came in just to do something, I guess, they were on standby, so they felt, felt like doing something. So the um, fighters dive bombing? Yeah, they're dive bombing. Uh, normally it looked like about 30, 40 degrees, um, okay. and uh, with a 3,000 foot release, I guess. Um, once, and uh, the fact, fact, uh, would also drop flares. Okay. So you had a pinpoint of light on the ground. Uh, they dropped flares to one side, 
you had the fighters on the other side of the target uh, in their in their pattern, um, and under flares you could put down a rocket, and people could see the white marker, um, smoke marker. So it was a bit like day, but you just had to be a bit more uh, oriented, you know, um, <laughs> with your instrument flying and uh, just like you were bombing, you know, you had to have your wits about you. Yeah. Did, did, did you, was, as a general rule, did you encounter much ground fire? No, I, I, only once or twice I, I thought I saw some, um, and they were sort of like tracer. Um, and But... Uh, Fuk Tui province was pretty quiet. Um, there was a lot on the ground going on, but um, not like uh, there wasn't the activity, say, on the on the Ho Chi Minh Trail where there's lots and lots of targets walking around and driving around. We just had you know, little elements um, of uh, the uh, local uh, uh, Viet Cong forces. Okay. Um, how, how many... Uh... Radio frequency, were you working while you were? I'm going to get around to a mission next question, but how many radio frequencies were you working while you were doing a job? Yeah, we, we had four radios um, uh, UHF, VHF, and two FMs. Um, UHF for the fighters, VHF for uh, local traffic, like G, um, air traffic control, and, and uh, we used to talk to nine squadron um, bush rangers and, and slicks. And the other FM was uh, for either the ground troops or the tactical air control party. Um, so you're you're busy. Just, basically, once you got the mission running, just with the fighters. But then you had to, if you're working with troops on the ground, you had the FM going as well. So you're pretty and that busy. Kept you busy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I can't. I, uh, I've only ever operated, I think, two radios at once, and I think four would be you know, <laughs> in your headache after a while. Yeah, well, it's, it's always always one solution: turn the volume down. <laughs> Get rid of one radio. <laughs> yeah. And can you take me through a typical mission now that we got a little bit of background? Just a typical one, because my next question after this, I want to hear about one that was a little bit more exciting than usual. But if you could take me through a typical mission just so that people can hear what might happen from the time you're on the ground and et cetera, and the time, but to the time you actually come back in, in land. Yep. But, um, just to step back one, the, the majority of missions were visual reconnaissance. So you went out there, you were given a grid square or grid squares. It might be five, five kilometres by two, and you just kind of patrolled up and that. After a little while, you got to know the ground what to look for, um, and uh, probably 90% of those VR missions, we had um, Possum aircraft, which are the uh, Australian Army uh, light aviation uh, using a Sioux. So that was most of our work. Uh, the actual close air support side of things, um, uh, that was uh, typically um, you would, uh, you'd be tasked to the mission uh, the night before or early that morning, no, you had to, you knew where you're going. Um, fortunately, at Vung Tau, we were right next to um, the Air Force, Australian Air Force Intelligence Organisation, so you could go in there and update yourself with what's happening with the Army and on the ground and, and artillery and all that sort of stuff. So you went prepared with all that. Um, you flew out to the area, contacted the Tactical Air Control Party, who updated you with grid references and, and call signs of the fighters and any ground cool signs that were involved. Um, you went out and sussed the area. Uh, you tried not to sort of concentrate on the area because that any anybody on the ground might say, well, you know, we're in for it if they get us O2 circling overhead making lots of noise. Um, once um, we're established, normally sort of 10 to 15 minutes prior to the uh, rendezvous with the fighters, uh, they come up in frequency. You tell them where to rendezvous and what altitude and then you would brief them on the target, the target's description, altitude, uh, any winds, safe areas to um, uh, eject or uh, to abort uh, the mission, uh, troops on the ground if that were, were involved, whole bunch of information. You establish what weapons they got. You would establish how you wanted to use them, in other words, bombs and then guns. Um, and then um, 
you would mark the target. Uh, they would identify the uh, your smoke. If there's anybody on the ground, we'd get them to mark with coloured smoke. Um, so the, we, the fact, could see where they were. Uh, quite often that wasn't visible to the fighters, but you could describe it to them. And um, then uh, during the once it's established in the pattern that that uh, that roll in on the attack heading, you would um, follow them through. Once you 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 um, confirmed the point in the right direction, um, uh, you would clear them hot, and uh, and that that bomb you would then correct the bombs for the next guy coming through. Um, quite often the guys weren't on on tack heading or uh, that was important because troops on the ground, uh, you would tell them to uh, uh, abort um, and uh, they'd have to go around again. So it would just become a routine. Uh, your manoeuvring would generally things like figure eight just to keep yourself in sync with the, the guys because you always wanted to see them yeah. at base and during the, the, the attack yeah. itself. Yeah. So it's a pretty busy time. Um, you uh, finished off um, then giving them information about time on target, uh, how they went in terms of percentage bombs on target, or you know if they were really gross, you could say that all your bombs are outside 300 meters or something like that. Um, and then BDA, um, I was never a believer in BDA from a fact because you you couldn't see unless it was a bridge or a ford or something in the open. If it's on the jungle, you had no idea. So it was always, uh, you, you could just say, well, we're going to send SAS or troops back in that area and we'll send a BDA at a later, later date. That's, that's a bomb damage assessment. Bomb damage, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so how long would that mission normally last? Oh, um, that whole whole procedure probably lasted 20 minutes, maybe yeah, 20 minutes, I guess. Uh, depending on uh, with the uh, the Canberra's, it lasted longer because they had to do about a five mile run in straight. Um, so you're fiddling your thumbs for ages whilst it came in and dropped its bomb and then went all the way around again. These were a twin engine Australian bomber. Yeah, yeah, they were pretty good. There's some pretty gross errors, but uh, you could always tell you knew who the voices were, the, who were the pilots were, and. Um, and uh, you can say, well, this is going to be a good day. Or if you heard one guy who had, sounded underconfident or you didn't recognise him, you could say, well, they could go anywhere. But, you know, uh, in many cases, it's an area to target for them rather than a pinpoint. So there are a lot of area targets rather than pinpoints. Yeah, because because um, in, in the jungle, you're given a grid reference and it's your guess as to where that grid reference actually was. And so um, it's only as good as your navigation, uh, unless you had something specific like a, a river crossing, a ford, you know, partially constructed wooden bridge, which you could see um, generally. It was, and the area of, uh, of uh, dispersion of the bombs would cover an area, that would cover the, the grid reference you're, you're going for at any rate. Did, did you do one or more of those a day in, in that sense, in the general sense? Yeah, you could do one to three or four. Um, if there was a, a rush on due to bad weather north, we had three or four fighters would come through. So you, you could be busy there for a couple of hours. So what was your endurance over the target? Uh, about two and a half to three hours. All right. So most of the, most of the missions, VR and FAC missions, were around about two, two and a half hours. Did you get a sore bum? Uh, no, you're too busy. <laughs> busy. <laughs> you no, got, was you it got a pretty work. comfy seat, was it? Oh, it was just a, a typical uh, um, canvas type seat. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, you got a bit tired, and, and uh, but when when the job was on, you, you forgot all that and got on with, got on with it. Yep. And so now, now can you give me a, a mission where um, where uh, it, it became a, a, you know some sort of more critical um, result that was needed rather than yeah um, one in particular um, we uh, 
our intel briefing established where SAS patrols were and avoided them because we didn't want to fly over, make noises or track uh, guys on the ground and the fact that there might be somebody in their area. Um, but we always listened on the on the SAS uh, FM frequency and um, occasionally they'd come up whispering with a call sign, uh, you know, fact, this is 2-1. And um, so you knew it was 2-1. It was a SAS patrol and they would say, Ship, we got trouble. We got we're surrounded by guys, and we're trying to make out our way to the elves that, that we're going to be extracted. And this one particular sortie, um, I got that very call, um, and they were they were being um, uh, forced out of their 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 hide, their location uh, by a force who were shooting um, uh, at them, and um, they called for extraction. Uh, my immediate reaction was, you know, how long is going to, you know, will you take to get to that point? And um, once I was established that, I got onto the tactical air control party, um, said, this is a situation. I want an immediate airstrike called. I want artillery uh, and I want uh, bush rangers and slicks to extract these guys at the LZ. So a bush uh, ranger was what, mate? Bush ranger was... Um, a uh, Huey helicopter armed with uh, uh, too many guns and rockets. Okay, keep going then. Eh? So you're going to that. Yeah, they were to keep the bad bad, bad guys' heads down. Um, uh, the 7.62 minigun really didn't do a hell of a lot, but it made enough noise and scattered a few leaves around to uh, help, help slow down or... Uh, um, uh, extraction of troops on the ground. Um, so the first thing um, that was available was artillery. Um, so I got those on on target. I established where the SAS guys were and then worked the guns out uh, beyond them, uh, two or 300 metres, and then just slowly worked in as they were moving, just worked in closer and closer. Um, then, then the fighters turned up, so I was able no, to get Sorry, up. at this stage, are they, talk, are they talking to you, giving you feedback on the uh, on the effect of the artillery? Artillery, I'm, I, as a fact, you control it. You, I know, you, but the, the SAS guy is saying, wow, that's... that's, oh, that's... Sorry, yes, yes. Um, the, the important thing, of course, is how close were you to the fall shot and, um, and, and then you made a judgment that you could bring it in closer... Uh, or stop at that point until they get further away. Uh, if they had time and the resources, they could throw a smoke, uh, but generally they were trying to move away from the area as quick as possible and they didn't want to be um, observed. Um, once the fighters came in, uh, it kind of pounded the general area, uh, knowing that uh, the bad guys aren't going to follow in a straight line. Um, they're going to move to one side or other. Um, and follow rivers and, and gullies and things. So you sort of work the fighters around that sort of area. Meantime, the, the choppers are coming in um, and uh, uh, they would talk to the SAS guys and the, the bush rangers would put down fire behind their line and they could get in a lot closer because uh, yeah. they could often see the guys. Um, uh, then uh, the whole point of the, the artillery and the fighters were to slow down and prevent overrunning the SAS guys. They got to the LZ, LZ and they were extracted by the choppers. And once, uh, once we'd done that, um, the more immediate airstrikes came in and all I did was then move them up the, up the line of advance of the, the bad guys, thinking they might be now running away, so we're just going to pound the hell out of the area. Uh, with artillery and, and fighters. So, you know, it gave you a good feeling that um, uh, you're on the, on the spot to, um, to help out the guys on the ground. So how far do you think they had to move from where they were popping it to get to the extraction point? Oh, they were probably had to move probably three or four kilometres. Okay. So it was a fairly extended uh, yeah. Oh, episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it took over probably... Two two and a half hours for the whole whole thing, um, and 
it was always interesting to get the feedback from the fat guys, uh, sorry, the um, the SAS guys, because, uh, you know, so they'd, they'd come up and say, you, we can hear you guys and we know you're there, you're going to, you know, we're uh, looking after them. We've got their back, so to speak. And um, they were always uh, appreciative of uh, the assistance. Um, sometimes if there's nothing going on, they just like to have a bit of a chat and you could do that too. <laughs> So did, would you say the system in that sense was pretty responsive, responsive to needs when you ask for artillery and you ask for fighters and you ask for choppers and particularly slicks and bush rangers? Did, would you find the system pretty responsive? Yeah, yeah, particularly artillery because they're, you know, within within a minute, once you've uh, got approval uh, to use them, uh, they've got shots in the air. Uh, they're they're on a sort of a standby readiness type thing when they know there's uh, people out out in the field, and um, and generally they I'd imagine they would have guns pointed in the right directions just in case. Uh, now you you needed to be aware of where they were firing from and where they, oh. the sh shots were landing because I suppose the last thing you want to see was an artillery shell go past you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the, the guns were out of um, a Nui Dat or a, a, um, uh, a fire base uh, established, so you knew where they were. And uh, once you established uh, which gun was going to use, you could then coordinate the fighter movement with the uh, the airspace that the, the artillery shell was going to occupy and um, keep everybody safe that way. Um, but they were, they were really good. They were very accurate. I, I was very impressed. Um, I used to train our my students uh, to call up a practice shot, and um, and you give them a grid reference, and to the best of our ability, we'd find a, a big rock or a, a little lake or something, and um, they were so good you could almost predict that the on first round uh, before you would normally go fire for effect, in other words, the whole battery would fire. You just fire the one round, and but they were always within fifty, maybe outside hundred meters. Yeah, that's good. Which uh, you know is, is only as good as your your um, your target uh, yeah. description and, and and grid reference at any rate. Yeah. So were they um, what uh, what size were they? The artillery. Uh, uh, the artillery was uh, one hundred five. The Australian artillery was one hundred five millimeter uh, oh, yeah. Um The Americans had one five five uh, tracked and uh, stationary. Um, uh, howitzers. So did they join the game very often? Quite often, yeah, yeah, yeah. We um, they were always on call. Um, uh, when you go out on a visual reconnaissance, that you always had to be aware of where artillery is going to be fired because um, a lot of artillery we use for preparation for ground operations. Uh, not not now, but perhaps tomorrow, and. Um, so they used to soften up the targets prior to the, uh, the troops being taken in there by helicopters. So you obviously had rules of engagement to abide by for safety reasons of both of all parties. Um, yep. Were they uh, liberal enough to give you operational flexibility or did sometimes the rules of engagement um, hinder you? They were... Um... I, I guess rules of engagement were largely um, for the bigger picture. Um, by the time we got down to us, the, our rules were really how close could you put bombs to okay. the troops, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, and to civilians, uh, when you were civilians are nearby, okay, I would you know, you avoid them. Uh, but that normal that sort that sort of level decisions were made long before we got tasked. So did you have any close calls in, in the sense of um, from anything? Not yeah. Time, I, I had a close call. I was uh, new that taking off and I just lifted off and this big bloody pheasant floated across in front of me and I couldn't dodge it because I was, you know, that stage of takeoff. It hit the prop hub, bounced off my windscreen and the wing, um, I looked down, everything was still running, so I thought, okay, I'm keeping going. When I got back the, um, to Vung Tao, um, 
Uh, we had bits of pheasant everywhere. Uh, had cracked the, the, the cowling for the uh, engine and put a dink in the uh, leading edge of the wing. And of course, there's blood and guts everywhere. <laughs> did you have a um, did you have a, uh, a an urgent mission that kept you going after the pheasant strike? Uh, no, that was a, just a transit. Okay, all right. I'd, I'd been, um, I'd probably been, the reason I used to go to New Edat was to be um, a duty officer at the TAC P. Um, quite often um, I would, uh, on days off when I wasn't flying, I'd get a helicopter ride or an O2 ride up to New Edat, go fly with Possum uh, the, uh, on visual reconnaissance missions. And that was good fun because... I, looking back, it's probably stupid, but you fly with those guys, the, the treetops, they're looking for uh, um, trenches and tunnels and tracks and all that sort of stuff. And and uh, when you're marking for the um, for the fact, quite often uh, you were the guy chucking out the smoke grenades. Um, so you're kind of exposed <laughs> to um, anybody who decided to take you on on the ground. But so these we, were the light observation helicopters. Yeah, the little Sioux, um, uh, I forget what the, uh, the title was, but just a bubble he flew in, um, yeah. little six-cylinder yeah. Lycoming engine. Yeah, great fun. I could fly them better than I could fly a Hue Huey. <laughs> and this is, this is all wrong. It doesn't make sense because uh, the Sioux was all manual, you know, like manual struggle, yeah, yeah, yeah. manual yeah. Uh, cyclic, whereas uh, Huey, as you well know, um, the engine speed was fixed and the, all you have is cyclic and, and the rest of it. But, uh, yeah, I could land a Sioux and <laughs> a lot easier. And I, ah, that's uh, funny. And I, 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 I confess I, I bent the undercarriage of a Huey on a landing one stage um, when uh, uh, Bob Chalor, uh, yeah. he was captain and um, he was letting me fly and I got a bit... <laughs> Ham fist at the end, <laughs> and uh, we had to walk away from that one with a bent <laughs> and uh, undercarriage. Well, we won't tell Bob what we said. <laughs> tell him not to watch this video. Yeah, there you go. So, what? Just quickly, what were the good hallmarks of an FAC? What were the pressure points of an F for an FAC? The real, the real points that made it successful or unsuccessful or marginally successful. What were the the dot points of a good FAC, that what were the things that you found were the most important to handle? Well, the basic um, premise uh, of a fact was he was a qualified current fighter pilot. Yep. Um, and if you uh, met that criteria, you could understand uh, weapons delivery yep. of, of a fighter. You can tell what's going through his mind, what his yep. problems are what he can see from those altitudes yeah. um, and so on. So uh, tied in with all that was your ability to think clearly, which is a fighter pilot's um, characteristic. Um, and uh, uh, and it was a steep learning curve when we first got there, but those four radios you talked about, you got pretty confused with that for a little while, but after a little while you become a, like a like a pianist, you, you knew exactly. You didn't have to look. Your hands found things, and you know where what to go. You're into the into the groove of uh, procedural uh, operations. So that was a bit like flying a mirage. You oh, had to yeah. find things with your hands and know where they were because you didn't have time to look. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> um, yeah. It was um, when uh, in the last half of my. I, uh, by posting, um, we got a lot of new guys. They were just pilots straight off uh, air, from the training. Uh, they went through to Herbert to do fact training to convert to the, to the O2, came to Vietnam with no experience. They went fighter pilots. Wow. They knew nothing. So we really had to um, spend a lot of time with those guys. Uh, at the same time that was happening, um, there were not enough fighter pilots in the uh, in, in, in the loop. So they're dragging all these old farts, old, old B-52 drivers and, and uh, C-141 transport drivers. So we had to teach them, you know, they had the experience of flying, but they had no experience with 
fight operations and weapon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a steep learning curve for, for them and hard damn work uh, for us. Yeah. Uh, is, yeah. And did you mostly fly, you said it, the O2, was it twin seat? Two seat, yeah. Yeah, did you fly very often with someone in the other seat? Oh, yeah, as an instructor, yeah. No, 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 just on a tip of your mission. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Um, uh, Night time, we always had to have two guys. Okay. okay. The rest of the time, it was an opportunity type thing. If, um, like in days off, I, I wasn't going to sit around on my backside. I, I used to fly with the Hueys or the Sioux or just go fly with, the, with one of the guys if they were quite happy for me to go along. Yeah, good. I kept myself busy. Yeah, I can. I, having been to a few isolated places, I understand why. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. So the, 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 the sort of last question is, did you reflect very often on the, the, the criticality of what you were handling or how critical it was? Did you reflect very often that if you got it wrong, all sorts of things went wrong? If you got it right, all sorts of things went right. Did you reflect very often on that weight you had on your shoulders as far as your part being spot on? Uh, not really. Would that be a reasonable statement that your part needed to be spot on? Oh, of course, of course, it's critical, um, and, and and your job was was uh, critical to the lives of the guys on the ground. So there's a big responsibility there. Um, I guess you take with you uh, with all these things a lot of confidence, um, and backed up by a lot of knowledge of what's on the what's on the ground and what's happening. Um, a lot of knowledge of uh, expectations from the fighters themselves. So, um, but if all those things came together, as you say, it, it was it was easy. Yeah. Uh, all you need is to throw in uh, bad weather, or um, somebody who's not quite doing their job, um, or a complex ground situation, it become pretty iffy, and you had to be really circumspect and, 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 yeah. and careful of what what you tried to do. Yeah, that's good. Well, I enjoyed that. Um, it's nice to hear the ins and outs of another job um, that that you find yourself engaged in because you go from something like a Mirage or an F-18 and the next minute you're sitting in a, an O2 and um, <laughs> not quite with the same power or the speed or <laughs> other other, um, other attributes, so it's, it's really good. Um, yeah. Is there anything you want to add, that an anecdote or a, an observation? or? A... Oh, there's, there's, um, as, uh, as Dave Robson said once uh, in one of his uh, stories, which he wrote prolifically, um, I hold or make the claim of having flown the, the O2 to its maximum altitude with fully loaded uh, fuel and and things, I, mean, I got to fourteen thousand feet. <laughs> roughly. Um, it took ages to get there, and I was waiting on a a, a um, uh, magpie, a, a Australian Canberra, to come through, and I told him to rendezvous at, at, at fifteen thousand feet, and he said, "What what are you doing up there?" And I said, I, "I couldn't get any higher." <laughs> <laughs> That took him a while to sink in, but you know, then it took me an age to descend down to the operating uh, altitudes. But um, yeah, sometimes you had to use your imagination to, to fill in time when, when um, things were delayed for whatever reason. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for participating because um, I find these just as interesting, I hope, as people who watch them. Um, but if, you, if you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe to our channel and you can probably uh, pick up some more um, people like Barry who want, who will tell us about a different life. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Matt. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please subscribe to our channel. Our channel supports veterans directly and indirectly. We are all volunteers. Additionally, if you go to the description of this particular video, you'll see links to the Australian Military Aviation History Association and links to Air Force Association New South Wales and 
you'll see the subscription button to subscribe to our premium aviation magazine.